so um, it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome Sigrid Nunes to um, the online Conrad Festival in Krakow. And of course, I'm very sad that we couldn't meet in tense person, but I'm sure that this will happen sooner or later. Uh, Krakow will be waiting for you always. But for the time being, let me just introduce you briefly and then we'll go on with our conversation. Uh, Sigrid is okay. the author of, of uh, novel Friend, um, and the, the novel won the National Book Award in the United States in 2018 and became an international bestseller. Uh, it was published in Poland uh, under the title of Przyjaciel, which means friend, uh, in Dobromiła Jankowska's translation. Um, and uh, uh, Sigrid's next and most recent book, which is called what are you going through? Uh, it's going to be published in Poland in a couple of weeks in the same translation. Unfortunately, under a change title, which says Pełnia Miłości in Polish, which means something like the complete love or the plentitude of love. I'm really sorry about this change of the title because I think you, the original one is very powerful and I hope we'll be able to talk a little bit about this title later on during our uh, talk. Um, Sigrid, of course, is the author of many books, and some of them are The Feather on the Breath of God, her debut in, uh, published in 1995, um, a little book which I am very fond of, which is called Mitz, the Marmoset of Bl Bloomsbury, uh, published in 1998, and um, recently Salvation City 2010, and her memoir uh, called Sempre Susan, a memoir of of Susan Zontag. Um, Sigrid has been awarded a lot of very prestigious uh, prizes and also shortlisted for many prestigious prizes. Um, four of these uh, um, awards came after 2018. So of all your books, it's the friend that actually uh, uh, was the, received around the world or worldwide um, most uh, enthusiastically. It is a story about a huge dog which suddenly enters the life of a fragile little lady. Uh, your recent novel actually has a cat in it. Uh, so I wanted to start with a fundamental question. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Ah. I am a cat person. Wow! I, uh, I am very. What a I, surprise! I'm very fond of dogs. <laughs> I guess it would be if you if you read the friend. But I do love all animals, and I I probably do love dogs and cats equally. But I've always thought of myself as a cat person. I um. Uh, I've had dogs in my life, but I've had more cats in my life, and they're just, uh, I don't know, I think they are the most, uh, the, the most special uh, animal that you can have as a pet. So, mm -hmm. as I say, I've always thought of myself as a cat person. Uh, there is something very special and not that simple in human-animal relationship. Uh, you wrote about uh, Leonard Wolf and his marmoset, and you wrote about dogs and cats. Um, why are you interested in this uh, unobvious, changing, um, complicated relationship? A dog and a human being. Well, I, I mean, an animal well, and I a think, human being. Well, I think it's, it really is a remarkably special relationship. I mean... Um, you know, first of all, animals of all kinds, particularly domesticated animals, have, uh, are so important to our lives. And if you take the animals that we keep as pets, for example, people have deep, meaningful relationships with their pets. Uh, you know, to the degree that they conceal, many of them, how much they feel and for their pets, for their dog or their cat. And even feel some shame as they have expressed it to me about those feelings, particularly when they lose the animal. And they'll say things like, mm -hmm. um, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't feel like this. It's been terrible. It's a whole year. I still cry every day. I'm ashamed. Um, mm -hmm. It's not as if it were a person. But the relationship is extremely important to people. And they, um, you know, also because with, with the domesticated animals, they are, they are, they are human creations. 
hearts. We bred mm. them to mm. have qualities that we would find most desirable. Uh, and in mm. the dog, of course, we bred most devoted companion. Uh, you know, someone, uh, someone, some, some, some creature, some uh, someone, being, yeah, someone that that uh, that 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 is capable of unconditional love, and of course, so are some human beings, parents in particular. Uh, but uh, but I think that that is a really important part of it. People are able to get from their pets a kind of unconditional love that very often in life they are not able to find from another human, no matter how much they love humanity or their family mm -hmm. or whatever. So, and, but also I think it just comes from, you know, everything comes from childhood, of course. And I was, where I, where I grew up in a housing project, no pets were allowed. Now at a certain point we did have a cat. We, my, my mother rescued a cat from a fire in the neighborhood and mm -hmm. she healed that cat and she kept that cat no one ever bothered us about it. It never went outside. But I was already maybe 12 at that point. I grew up uh, in a place where no pets were allowed and with a great passion for animals. You know how many children have this kind of passion for animals. So even as a school, as a school child, I was the child known uh, in, my, in my classes, oh, that secret is the animal lover. Mm -hmm. The animal lover. So, you know, and everything I wanted to read at that time was uh, books about animals. So, uh, so for me, it's, it's always been a very, a very deep love. Um, and that, you know, and, and, and for the way people relate to animals, uh, watching them, you know, the way they mm -hmm. are with their dogs, listening to their stories about their pets, has always seemed to be very rich material for, for thinking about and writing about. When you think about the kind of relationship between people, humans and animals, very often what, what enters the picture is um, some kind of sentimentality or, um, you know, this kind of warm, warm uh, uh, um, constructed kind of image of, of the animal. When you write about Leonard Wolf and his marmoset, what you stress is that he was not sentimental. He was ready to admit that this was an animal, that Mitz was an animal, and that as every creature, it's going to die. So the death of the animal was not the end of the world. I was wondering if this is important for you, this unsentimentality of thinking of the, of the, um, the way people construe uh, animals. Well, I'm not someone who minds when people are sentimental about their own animals. Um, mm. I'm not somebody who is disgusted by anthropomorphism, because as I say in The Friend, yes, I know this is really anthropomorphic, but sometimes that's the form that love takes. Uh, so people, when they are baby talking to their animal or telling you endless mm -hmm. stories of, about how intelligent their 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 dog is etc i don't i don't really mind that i i know mm -hmm. that with leonard leonard wolf, leonard wolf was actually quite quite a fierce person in many ways from what i can tell and he it bothered him tremendously that Everywhere he went with mitts, the marmoset on his shoulder, the same couple of stupid, in his view, things were said. Uh, mm. Certain kind of squealing about, oh, look at the little, look at the little monkey. And then people would say things like, oh, you poor thing. And he would say, she's not poor and she's not a thing, which is actually something I heard in, um, mm -hmm. At the at the at the market at the farmers market where someone had a dog and some woman came over and she said, "Oh, you poor thing," and the mm -hmm. owner said, "She is not poor. She's not a thing." So, um, mm -hmm. so I see both sides of it. I, I'm not, as I say, I'm not, I'm not put off by a certain kind of sentimentality, um, but uh, you know, you can't argue with people's feelings. If they're going to feel that it's the end of the world, that their cat died, what are you going right. to say to them? Stop feeling mm. that. Um, no. <laughs> on the other hand, no. On the other hand, <laughs> you know, I think that a certain kind of uh, sentimentality, you know, in certain cases can can lead people maybe to not be the best parents to mm. their to their dog or cat. Mm. That is true.
I am asking about this because on the one hand, I am fascinated with the way animals are portrayed in uh, modernist writing. For example, in Virginia Woolf, the striking essay on, uh, well, she wrote about the dogs, her dogs, and some of the conclusions she comes to are really uh, shocking or cruel from our point of view. Uh, and the essay about the death of the moth, when she looks at this little creature, which is nothing but a little drop of life. And then the death says, I I'm stronger than life. Uh, on the other hand, there's Catherine Mansfield with this beautiful, shocking story, the last one she wrote on canner uh, about a canary, about a lady who has a, uh, a, this bird in the cage. And when the bird dies, there is, she says, I, I lost everything. I lost my only friend. So, so all this is possible. But I am also a, a very much interested in seeing that in the context of a broader picture of our relationship to nature and the um, ecological awareness. Uh, in uh, what you're going through, um, you have this figure of the um, lecturer who uh, travels around the world and preaches this apocalyptic vision of the end of the world. And he, and he says, uh, well, actually, you should not have children. We should be aware that uh, prolonging life on this planet is dangerous, is bad. Well, not dangerous, it's bad. Uh, and while I was reading that, I was thinking all the time whether you were being a little bit ironic or 100% serious here in bringing this issue forth. Well, I wasn't being ironic. I um, The lecturer, uh, and that comes very early in the book, uh, is mm -hmm. someone who, who is lecturing on uh, uh, climate change and the, the uh, ecological, the threats to, to the ecology, and does have an apocalyptic vision, as many people have. And mm. he decides that he's going to get up there and say what he truly believes, which is that it actually is too late at this point. We've, we've done this terrible thing. We've waited too long. And uh, we're, we're too disorganized and too divided globally and certainly nationally um, to, to do what needs to be done in the time we have to save the planet. And he foresees enormous suffering and the end, basically the end. And this is what he tells people. He won't take any questions after his uh, mm -hmm. talks. Once upon a time, he was a different kind of... Um, a lecturer, he talked. To, he he would talk about the cult, culture and the arts. But now this is all he does. He is uh, in his sixties, so he has children. In fact, he has grandchildren, and he explains that one of the reasons why he does this, in spite of this extraordinarily pessimistic view, is because he keeps thinking about that moment when his grandchildren are old enough to say, "Where were you, your generation? What did you do before this catastrophe?" So I, w I wasn't being ironic. The, the thing is that that then takes mm -hmm. him to the idea, certainly not that he's saying everyone who is expecting a child out there should go and have an abortion. He would never say that. What he mm -hmm. is saying is that maybe we've come to this extreme point where we might need to consider whether it is the wisest uh, thing to do to have children, to bring more children into the world. Maybe in his view, mm -hmm. uh, it's even a little bit cruel to do that if uh, certain predictions about the future of the world, of the globe, uh, 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 are, mm -hmm. are possible, that life might become, if not entirely unlivable, uh, you know, uninhabitable, the, the earth not entirely in uninhabitable, uh, that mm -hmm. life will be just so dreadful that maybe it isn't the right thing. And he adds that besides, are there not millions and millions of children right now in desperate need? Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a view. It's a view. It, it, is, it is the most extreme view. So I wasn't being ironic because I, I do know mm -hmm. quite a few people who do hold this mm -hmm. view. Mm -hmm. and, I know, and I do know people uh, of a certain age who are uh, who are quite anguished right now about whether or not they should have a child. They 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 came to their thirties, always thinking they would have children. Do they want children? Yeah. Very 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 much, but they don't know if that is the right thing to do, and they are suffering. So that's really what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. um, the word suffering just 
cropped out. Uh, so I wanted to um, to say that in for me, both of these books uh, are basically centered on a meditation on what makes us human and what uh, makes us um, um, continue to be human. Um, and I think one of, of the, the main answers you give or you experiment with is connected with care. So this man, in his very extreme and radical way, is trying to say, I care for other human beings. I am worried about them. But of course, uh, the, the, for me, the main um, element of care and the main figure of care comes with the title of your book and with the recent one and with the context it comes from. So it is a quotation from uh, Simone Weil's 1942 essay, actually um, uh, devoted to the use of study, of education, of self-development. Uh, but th this is a striking question. And if you allow me, I would like to read a, um, a couple of sentences from this essay to give everybody a, 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 the, the context for, for this uh, question. Uh, so Simone Weil says, the love of your neighbor in all its fullness simply means being able to say to him, what are you going through? It is a recognition that the sufferer exists not only as a unit in a collection or a specimen from the social category labeled unfortunate, but as a man, exactly like us, who was one day stamped with a special mark of affliction. For this reason, it is enough, but it is indispensable to know how to look at him in a certain way. This way of looking is first of all attentive. The soul empties itself, so all its content in order, sorry, it's, it's, the soul empties itself of all its content in order to receive into itself the being it is looking at, just as he is in all his truth. Only he who is capable of attention can do this. Um, so is it attention to other human beings or is it uh, compassion that makes us human, you think? I think it begins with that attention. I mean, her, her quote is very beautiful. First of all, the, the, the briefer one that appears in my book, but then what you just read. Uh, I think it begins with attention. And as we all know, uh, uh, to Simone Weil, attention, attention was prayer. A certain kind of attention is prayer. Um, you don't know what's going to happen necessarily. But uh, another way to put it, it uh, the words that somebody who is going through any kind of difficulty, three, three little words that that person might want to hear, would want to hear, I think, is talk to me. Uh, people will even say that when they, you, somebody, you, hear, so you hear somebody, somebody, you pick up the phone and it's your friend. Your friend is, uh, starts to speak, chokes up, then is crying can't speak, and you say very gently, talk to me. You have no idea what, what the, they're about to tell you. They might be telling you that in the next sentence that they just murdered their wife or something. <laughs> but, you, <laughs> but you begin. <laughs> or, or I hate to... I'm sleeping with your husband. <laughs> I, I, I never liked you. And I don't, I don't want to be your friend anymore. I mean, they could be saying something terrible, you know. But as soon as you hear, you know, if you have any heart at all, as soon as you hear someone like that mm. uh, trying to speak and unable to, you say talk to me, you get, you get them to, to talk. And then, of course, you don't watch television while they're talking. You, don't, you, you, you listen. So I believe it starts there. It starts there with, with, with listening. You know, which, what t tell, me, tell me what it is that's happening to you. Of course, now, in French, as you know, it's « quel est ton tourment », which did not mm -hmm. translate well. Uh, in, in English translation, this is how we translate it. What are you going through? A bit awkward if you compare it to the to the French, right? But, but I, I, I think but, it's but, very but, powerful in English. I think actually it is very it is powerful, powerful in, in English, English because it go, you know, it, it shows is. you this this patch that you have to cross, uh, which hopefully will yes. end at some point, but perhaps not. 
Yes, it has that, it has that seed of hope in it. Uh, mm -hmm. We also say very often, I'm sorry for what you're going through. We say that all the time in English. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it be begins with asking that, being, finding it in yourself to ask that question with, with, with absolute sincerity and then being able to sit there and listen. And I think, you know, even, even, a, even a small trouble that somebody might be having, it having, um, you know, not that some world shattering suffering. Uh, if, if you listen, you, you realize what that's what what kind of emotion that's create what kind of pain that's creating in the person you know yes i think then you you reach that point where you have empathy and if it's a if it's a st for st stronger for something stronger you feel then compassion um but i think i think that that's li the listening passively or, or or quietly i should say not passively i think is much more important than what many people say because it's so hard to find the right things to say in very uh, important and extreme situations. People say, I'm crying because my father just died. And then you try to find the right words, but you come up with the same formulas. I am sorry for your loss. Oh, this is terrible. What can I, can I help you? Can I do, but, but no, there's, there's very little, you know, there are very few people who could come up with, with words that would be really comforting. Mm -hmm. But if you just listen, tell me about your father. I never met him. You've never really spoken about him. And then that person gets to speak, uh, however imperfectly. And you listen. I think that that really is the beginning of caring for a neighbor, mm. for the other. Um, isn't it the most... Uh difficult and the most uncommon of uh, reactions, actually. I was thinking while reading your book and while I was thinking about Simon Weil's essay that actually it's very difficult, first of all, to sincerely answer the question, what are you going through? Because we are not expected to share our suffering. We're not expected to be sincere about what what is happening to us. And the other thing is that very often when you try to speak about it, what you get is not this attention or expression of compassion, but actually a rival story. Oh, that's terrible. But listen what happened to me. Or listen yes. to what, what happened to a person I know. I, I bet that's, that's exactly true. And also I feel that, you know, I really don't know how it might have been in another time or in other cultures. But I do know that now people are very reluctant to, you know, start talking about what they're going through, mm. uh, except to maybe one or two very special people in their lives. You know, people have the idea that you should be telling that to a therapist. You know, people feel, well, I don't want to treat my friends like, like my therapist. Um, so there's there's that which I find very very troubling, and then I have it, it is, yeah go on. I I have a oh, friend who went. I've already, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You go on. Sorry, you go on. Yeah. I, went, mm -hmm. I I something that something that bothered me bothered me once was uh, it was actually at the gym. There was somebody. I mean, it was in a yoga class, and there was someone in a yoga class, and she she said something that I thought really. Uh, represented how people had started to feel about other people, at least, at least maybe here in New York City, where she just started talking about what she was, what, what, what are you going to do this evening? And, and she said, I was thinking about going out with my friends. And then I thought, do I really want to see my friends? Do I want to hear about their problems? Do I, do I want, do I want to have that drain on my energy? Or should I just, you know, stay in and watch a movie? And it was just something about that that she would that that would be her expectation. I'm thinking of going out with my friends because that would be fun for me. Oh, maybe not because maybe maybe they'll have mm -hmm. some you know maybe they'll want to talk about themselves and the way she would express it. Do I really want to hear them? Do I really need or want that drain on my energy? So as I say, I mean I don't know how new that is. I don't know how American that is. I don't know how New York that is. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but it but I it really did strike me. I found it very chilling, and um, and I, I it wasn't just her. It was it's it's an attitude. It's a general attitude. Um. You, in in both of these books, you study the concept of friendship, I'd say, in a very kind of experimental way, putting your characters on trial in radical situations, in extreme situations. So uh, I was wondering what your discoveries about friendship were, because I think, you know, uh, 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 I think the the, um, the question another shocking question that you ask in in what you're going through is uh, would you say yes or no if your friend asked you to be with her when she's dying uh, but but then i thought every friend asks this of you i mean if it's through friendship it, you know i'm i'm very suspicious of these huge qualifiers you always are next to a dying person we are all dying people uh, so, you know, perhaps what you study in these books is this very special relationship which pretends to be so modest and so everyday. You know, my friends, I'm going out with friends, which means I'm going out with, I don't know, colleagues from the office or, you know, or, or, or people or, or neighbors. Uh, but perhaps there is a difference uh, or a scale of friendships or perhaps friendship is this very heroic virtue that you are ready to, or not ready to, uh, exercise. Yeah, there's a. You know, I, th I, I, I think that being a good friend and having good friends is probably more difficult than than we think, especially after a certain mm. age. Um, it does start to feel more and more demanding. People start having, you know, as you get older, people start having more difficulties. Uh, some of their bad characteristics become more more uh, exaggerated. Then they begin mm. to have those great big adult problems like uh, divorce, trouble with children, um, money problems, and of course then illness. Um, and of course everybody is so afraid of uh, you know getting cancer or some other some other serious illness or even a less serious illness and everybody is terrified of dying so what happens i think is that um it's really not that uncommon for people uh when they get a serious illness you do lose some friends you do lose some mm -hmm. friends and uh uh you know so um I mean, it's 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 a terrible thing, but it but that but you know, I think uh, I don't remember exactly who I'm quoting here, but you know, uh, fear fear of fear of death is probably the strongest emotion that people have. Mm -hmm. So um, you know that has a lot that has a lot to do with it. I mean, in this particular case, people often end the the, the number of people who who uh, actually decide uh, when they have a terminal illness that they would rather control that moment themselves. Of course, there's a pretty small uh, amount of the population. Even people who decide they're going to do it and get the euthanasia drugs, mostly, of, most often they don't end up taking it. Mm -hmm. It's just a comfort to them to have it. So I was curious about that, about, you know, I, I, I do know of, not not people close to me, but people I've heard of, Family members have have you know been there, uh, who said yes, we'll we'll choose the moment for taking the drug and we'll be with you if that happens, you know that ha that certainly happens, but the idea of somebody asking a friend I think is, is is quite different, and I don't know how often that might have happened, and I certainly mm -hmm. don't know what I would do if someone asked me that. I mean there are various difficulties. There's the fact that it's illegal. I mean you could go to jail for mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. It's illegal, and, and even if you didn't, people don't, no matter what they might feel, they have a respect for the law. They don't want to break the law, you know, easily. They don't break the law easily. Um, so there's that. And then, you know, it is just such a, 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 a serious question to ask of a friend. I think that's why I wanted to, to write about it, because I, I honestly don't know what I would mm -hmm. do, but I know, but I know that I, I would, I would, what I would want to do, I would want to come through, I would want to come through for that friend, I would, but I don't know 
I can't say for sure that I would. Um, the, the thing that is clearly absent from these books is the question of religion. And Simone Weil was a, was a philosopher and a social thinker, but also a Christian mystic. Um, and, and her claim that this care for the other is uh, um, seen in this metaphysical perspective uh, is obvious in her writing, but it is absent from yours. I was thinking how you, um, how you, I mean, it's, it's so important for many people. It brings consolation, it brings help to people in, in extreme situations. Uh, do you think, I mean, what, 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 how would you, what, why do you want to, t to get rid of this kind of context for your thinking about um, friendship and dying and caring for other people? Well, it isn't, uh, you know, it isn't actually something that I, I think about, it uh, that I think about, uh, it isn't there to, to begin with. I mean, since I'm not a believer, uh, mm -hmm. and 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 the people that I write about are, are not believers in general, uh, just like the people I know aren't. So, um, so that wouldn't enter into it, you know. And I I suppose, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I did I did write a book uh, called Salvation City about a flu pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> and um, in that case, I did want to explore the ideas of American evangelical Christianity. Um, but th these are these are you know people who who just who t in my book are people who take certain things for granted. They never really examine their religion, mm -hmm. um, and um, so. So I don't, you know, I, I don't, uh, it, you know, I, I mean, I know that my, uh, you know, I take for granted that my characters don't believe there's going to be an afterlife. Um, mm -hmm. I do touch on it at a certain point in What Are You Going Through, where the narrator wonders why no one ever believes they're going to hell. But you, mm -hmm. don't, you don't meet people who believe they're going to hell. I, I meet mm -hmm. people who believe who are believers, and they don't believe they're going to hell. I mean, but they believe there is a hell, and there are people there. But no, but they they believe two things. One, they believe that they aren't going to hell, and two, they believe that they're going to see their loved ones again. So mm -hmm. they're obviously not in hell. Um, so, but as I say, I, it's it's uh, you know, on the other hand, if you grow up. Uh, steeped in Western culture. Christianity is there. It's in, it's mm -hmm. in so much of what you've read and loved and taken in. Um, it's, really not, it's really not escapable. It's, it's, par it's part of who you are, that Christianity, I think. It, so so, so, there, so, so it, is, it is still there, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I was also thinking, you know, what came to my mind uh, is a quote from T.S. Eliot, who in one of his dramas say, um, humankind cannot bear too much reality. And this is in the context of, of his uh, characters um, finding uh, this metaphysical dimension and even it, 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 uh, deciding to do extreme things and to suffer a lot and to uh, to sacrifice their lives uh, but the truth is hidden somehow why they're doing that what nobody can understand that because humankind cannot bear too much reality we need some kind of scaffolding to uh, to help us out of this feeling of of well, despair. I don't know. It just came to my mind I well, as I was reading your your um, reflections on, you know, on the inescapability of death, but on the other hand, on the on the need to to understand it somehow. That's very interesting because that is one of my favorite quotes, and it, I actually mm. quote Eliot in in my very first book, uh, A Feather on the Breath of God. I do quote that very. That very line. Oh, how interesting! Um, yeah, but because because it's, it's so it's so true. It's so true, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's um, you know, it's frightening in a way because uh, reality is there, and uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, uh, this, 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 this failure to, um, to deal with it, you know, I mean, to some extent, it will, it will result in a great deal of denial uh, about very important things in life. On the other hand, denial can be a very good thing. I mean, it, it, you have to get through <laughs> life. And sometimes, sometimes denial is, can, can be extremely helpful. In this, in the struggle to 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 deal with suffering <laughs> and so on, I would I wouldn't yeah. to survive. I wouldn't necessarily want to take. You know, this is the problem with the uh, the lecturer in my book, right? Is that the the that cold arrogance and the harshness of his bearing and his presentation, which he doesn't quite see, and his misanthropic uh, attitude in general. Um, ensures that he won't be listened to you know he doesn't quite get that because or or he people he will just make people angry um you know he's working against what he wants to achieve precisely mm -hmm. because it is a, a you don't get anywhere by a, a rubbing people's face in reality in a certain way either or or, <laughs> or scolding or mocking or you know mm. so Mm. Um, another concept that came to my mind when I was reading these both these books is that they are actually about courage and I thought that um, first of all is the courage of one's consent to be the part of the world to to keep on uh, go, to, to keep on going to to kind of live on and the other is the courage of admitting what you're going through uh, not you know in the in the way of complaining and find and and looking for for sentimental consolation but to stand face to face with the suffering that is your share uh, so the person who comes to my mind here is of course your friend and mentor susan zontag um and some critics say that the, the, what you're going through is actually a book about Susan Zontag uh, or inspired by her. I don't think it's that important if it's actually about her or not. Uh, but I was wondering how does uh, her life and how how does how has the um, the fact that you were friends um, uh, influenced your thinking about life and, and your own life? Well, two things. First of all, I was very surprised to hear uh, from uh, from a review uh, this idea that uh, the character in What uh, Are You Going Through has anything to do with Susan Sontag. Because, um, in fact, the attitude towards cancer, uh, terminal illness, and death of my character is the exact opposite of Susan Sontag's. Mm -hmm. And um, Susan Sontag would would have been outraged at the idea of taking euthanasia drugs, and um, uh, and and she would never. My character, when she first hears that she has cancer, and it, and it is not terminal at that point, they do not make that diagnosis. She thinks maybe I shouldn't go through chemo, and then she changes her mind, and then she does, and then unfortunately it doesn't work. That is about mm -hmm. as as different from Susan Sontag's real life as could be imagined. Um, you know, and they're just not, I mean, the only things they have in common is that they're writers. I mean, just Susan mm -hmm. Sontag was not a, a journalist. My, um, uh, and, um, it, 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 yeah, no, there's really no connection there. Um, but the but courage, okay, in, in, in my book, yes, courage certainly was very important. In, in my in my uh, ideas about writing both of these books, um, I am reminded of um, because it does take a lot of courage to, to face illness. It takes courage to die. It takes courage to take your own life. Uh, it takes courage to uh, to go on uh, when you've lost people. Um, I am reminded, you know, uh, this quote is attributed very often to the great uh, movie actress. Uh, Betty Davis, but people say, no, many people have said this many times. When she was getting older, she said, you know, growing old is not for sissies. Uh, sissy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And it's so, so great. <laughs> it's like, growing yeah. old is not for sissies. Growing old is not for babies. You know, you gotta be, mm. you gotta be one tough person to face growing old. Mm. Um, so, okay, now, Su- but Susan is somebody, Susan Sontag is somebody that I, I would always associate the word courage with, even though she was completely terrified of dying uh, mm. in a way that I've never seen anyone before. Um, but her, you're going through the, uh, the, the diagnoses. I mean, her first diagnosis, she was only 42 years old. Um, mm. Going through three bouts of cancer, doing everything that she had to find out about it, to be brave about it, to deal with it, and throughout the whole thing to work as hard as she could. Going through the chemo, going through all this suffering. Um, and she was somebody who, yeah, she had tremendous courage. So, so that was very important to me, uh, you know, she, uh, but, you know, but as a, as a model in, in other things, she was even more important to me because, I mean, I met mm-hmm. her when I was, you know, in my mid twenties and she had such, such a tremendous influence on me, uh, as far as what a writer should do, what, what a person should read, how, what kind of attitude you should have towards your own work. And I think the most important thing to me, um, at that time was because of my age and so on, you know, that other people were saying things like, well, when are you going to get a real job? And when are you going to get married? When are you going to get serious is basically what they meant instead of this, this writing stuff that, you know, I mean, I wasn't publishing at the time. And, Mm -hmm. you know, with her, with her, I felt that I got this kind of permission to take my work my little work at that time as seriously as possible Mm -hmm. uh, even though I hadn't been published that that was the right attitude and she had an idea that is really very uh, outdated at this point I mean I don't know anyone with this kind of thinking about writing you know she saw the writer as a as a heroic individual she saw writing as this extraordinarily noble activity and Mm. the best thing you could be doing with your life and to have had that kind of uh, uh, education at that time, not to mention her, her saying, well, you know, let's, let's go to the movies. You've never seen movies by the Japanese master Ozu. That won't do. You have to get an education in the films of Ozu and other Japanese films and French films and German films. And, and here are some books that you really, really should read. So, um, so yeah, that was absolutely, uh, uh, you know, a, a great, great of of great importance to me meeting her and paying attention to her Mm -hmm. you know there were times in my life there would be people will make faces when i say this or many people will at least here around me um there were times when i would be talking about uh things to people susan would come up and i would say susan susan is always right Susan Sontag is always right, I used to say. <laughs> of course, she, she wasn't, but I had every reason to feel that way because she was right about so many things. Mm. So many mm. things. A perfect mother figure for you. Well, but right also, Susan is some, Absolutely. And, and, and she, she also, um, Susan Sontag is famous for having said, everything matters. Everything matters. Very mm. important for a writer. And um, I think it's also important to say about Susan, what made her different from other people, uh, from a lot of other people, uh, was that she herself, she had this passion for educating other people. I mean, if she mm-hmm. met you and, and she knew that you didn't, that you had never been to see the New York City Ballet or that you had never heard a <laughs> performance of, of, of the marriage figure, she would just would stop everything to make sure that that mm-hmm. got done because she loved that so much. And the idea mm-hmm. that, that you didn't know, but she wanted whatever she thought was fine. And she thought a lot was fine. She had enormous, uh, enormous breadth of taste and likes. Um, she wanted to share it. She wanted to share it with everybody. Mm. Um, th- her words that I have in mind all the time is I, I never met her, of course, although she came, she used to come to Krakow uh, several times, but I never met yes, her. Yes, she did. Uh, is, 
is um, uh, an inscription that is reproduced on the volume of her late essays and it just says do something do something do something do something so she repeated in her hand several times i think it's so yes wonderful <laughs> um speaking of doing something um the the um the important and difficult thing that you tackle in both of these books is the issue of um, gaining absolute control over your death and the suicide. Um, this is ethically difficult and this is difficult in emotional terms. I was wondering um, when you thought and wrote about it, did you understand more about it? Did you, do you have answers now? Well, I think that for me, the um, I feel like my my narrator in the friend that after having had the experience of having the friend commit suicide and a year is passing and she's grieving and she thinks very hard about it. She talks to a therapist about it. She reads a lot of books about it. And in the end, she feels that it remains a mystery. So the suicide, suicide, it remains a mystery. And then in a sense, uh, maybe that's where it must remain. Maybe, maybe it isn't really the right thing to try to find a reason for it or, an, or to, to mm -hmm. understand it, because maybe the, the person who committed suicide chose mystery. So leave him his mystery. He didn't leave a note. He didn't, he didn't let people know exactly what he was doing and why. Um, he was, in fact, less depressed at the time than he had been at other times. You could guess at certain reasons, but I just, I agree also with, um, with the narrator in that it's so irrational. I mean, the only animal mm -hmm. that commits suicide is, 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 a, is a human uh, self-murder, self-homicide. It's so unnatural. It's it, that I think it's. I don't really feel like I I can understand it. Um, and sometimes when people commit suicide, it's even more mysterious than uh, with my character, a very young person, with all of life ahead, uh, mm. a person who had never shown any signs of depression. I mean, it, it, there is just suicide is so strange. Um, and then. So, I, and then again, again, I don't know if you, if a person who commits, I mean, there are, it's an, it's individual with each individual it's different, but I don't know. Are you really, are you really, uh, in control when you're doing that or are you completely out of control? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Um, particularly. Well, the, the, the character in, uh, sorry, the character in, in your other, in, in what are you going through also decides on. Well, this is euthanasia, but this also is a kind of suicide. Is she? Yes. Does she know what she's doing? Is she in control, or is she not in control? Finally. Well, that I think it's very interesting <laughs> that uh, for me, uh, what are you going through? I didn't think of it really as the same kind of suicide as the friend. Mm -hmm. I felt that it that it's very different. Uh, she was not a suicidal person, ha had never thought about it until she learned she had this illness. And then she thought, oh, maybe I will have to take matters into my own hands. Once she learns uh, that she really has very little time and that uh, and she knows that that time uh, could be very painful and, as she puts it, um, couldn't really be called living at all because you know when you're in that when you're something like that and you're in that kind of pain, uh, your your mind is only on one thing, which is getting out of that pain. Um, so she has this idea that if she can choose her moment uh, and her last thoughts and her her last deeds and all this, it would be infinitely better. And she doesn't want to suffer and she doesn't want to get to that point where. Uh, she can't do anything for herself anymore. Um, mm. So, and she's on that, that point, she's almost impatient to die because so, so why should she hang out at a hospice if she's just going to die anyway? So my feeling is if you're going to die anyway and you think that you're going to choose that moment, it really isn't the same thing as suicide, even though 
it is taking your own life. I don't think of it as self murder, uh, self homicide. That way, I think of it as well as choosing your moment. However, self however, self murder sounds terribly dramatic and kind of accusational. I'd say. That's true. <laughs> Sorry, That's I interrupted true. you. <laughs> it's true. Yes, it sounds like a terrible crime. Okay, with, mm. but with. You know, I mean, not that I might want to compare human beings to, I, I don't want to yeah. compare human beings to, to animals, but we all know that animals do not commit suicide. But how many animals, when death is near, stop eating? They stop mm -hmm. eating. They know what's happening. They stop eating. And in many cases, they will go off somewhere. An animal that has never left home and its owner will vanish and then the owner will find it you know, out somewhere in the woods where it has gone. So he, he, he went away to die. So, uh, you know, even the animal has a sense of trying to have some control over that, that last moment by not eating and so on. What, what, what is that, you know? Um, I know that's also anthropomorphic, but so my feeling is that she has this idea that she can have control over this and it would be much better. But there's a great deal of, uh, of, of delusion in it because as things turn out, you know, she, she's trying to choreograph her death and she's trying to create a narrative. She's trying to create an ending for a narrative. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's not really how life works. And dying is, is, is a part of life. Dying isn't death. Dying is life. You're still alive when you're dying. And, as it, life is messy, and you know, we as we say, in the midst of life there is death. Okay, so in my book, mm -hmm. in the midst of death there is life. Life keeps That's happening, true. and cha and it ha life has its own ideas and so on. So uh, yes, she has this idea about order, you know, order and peace and arranging things, and oh, she, you know, it's very. I mean, to me, it's very touching. Is this idea of why not? Why not a why not a beautiful death? I, 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 if I don't have to have the hideous, ugly death that nature has in store for me, hooked up to machines or, or, or taking these terrible medicines, maybe I could arrange it in a, in a very beautiful way and choose it. And of course, you know, that's not, that's not what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you say that uh, first person narration is a known suicide risk. And both these books are in first person. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you about your writing technique and the way you weave uh, your uh, text of voices, the voice of the narrator, which is perhaps your voice to a certain extent, or is it not at all? And the voice of your characters. I, I like very much the way in which these voices kind of merge into one texture of your writing and is well, it really risky you. to write in one person in first person i was completely shocked when i read that uh now i can't quite remember where i read that but i put it in the friend as uh part of the reading that my my narrator does about suicide she comes mm. up with this with this uh statement that apparently writing in the first person is a known suicide risk i had never heard that before um, so I don't, uh, the narrator of neither, the, the first person narrator of the friend and what are you going through, although they are not me, uh, we share two really important things. One is uh, a certain sensibility, and that's why the sensibilities of the narrators of both of those books are very, are very much the same. And it's very much my sensibility. And the way my narrator looks at the world and the way my narrator observes things and the kinds of things that come into her mind when she's thinking uh, are, are mine. I identify completely with them. The facts of what's happening in these, of these, in these stories, are, these, these are, are, are you know 99% invented. Um, mm -hmm. With the other characters, I just kind of trust my ear when I get them talking. But I don't, it's interesting because I do feel there's a chorus, there's a weaving, but I don't 
happen to do any weaving, by which I mean that I always write my <laughs> books in the same way, which I, as I, I don't plan or make outlines. So I begin with something, and then I, in the, and I'm in the, I'm, most of them are in the first person, but not all. And then I start uh, writing and thinking and moving a character about and uh, putting thoughts in a character's head, and then I just move on from there. And my character, one character, turns into two, turns into three, turns into four. And I just move on like that. And so then by the time I'm finished, revising all the time as I go along, you know, it's it's there, these these various voices. You know, I don't, um, I, I put them down as they come to me. I don't make an outline and then shuffle around and Mm -hmm. uh, rearrange and compose in that way. It's like a completely linear process. So everything that happens comes out of what came before. And it wasn't until, you know, I've, I've written a, a few books and they, they, you know, they aren't all, uh, so similar, but when I finished the friend, uh, I realized, and I didn't realize it while I was writing that it was the same narrator as my very first book which came out in 1995, A Feather on the Breath mm -hmm. of God. That narrator uh, who talks, and it's a coming of age book, so that narrator who talks about childhood and early life. Now, this is the same narrator in The Friend, only older. I recognize her. Mm -hmm. And now that's the same narrator in What Are You Going Through? Older, 60s. Um, so... So that 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 I think is that what you know the the idea of the of the as I say of the sensibility and the way of looking at the world in those three books mm -hmm. is very mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, your previous books, I think, are more concentrated on the plot and are more regular as novels. These two are more meditative, I'd say. Are you do you yes. think you moving towards this kind of essayistic take on your material? Well, I think that's very interesting because I uh that's why I was so so surprised in a way to think of um at the end of finishing writing the friend uh, the how much it was like my very first novel because that mm. first novel uh is very essayistic and if the form is very similar and it also is a, a book in which the narrator is a character, but is also a passive, uh, a passive presence to some extent, to some extent, presenting the story of her mother, the story of her father, mm -hmm. the story of this Russian immigrant that she becomes involved with. There's one part that's about wanting to be a dancer, but again, it's this idea of. The, mm -hmm. the narrator being someone who tells other people's stories, who lets other mm -hmm. people speak. And that was in the very first book. And then um, it was not for the, the second book. And then it was not for Mitz, which is, you know, uh, as much nonfiction, more nonfiction than fiction, Mitz, yeah. because I use the Bloomsbury archives to make that book. But in my book for Rowena, which is about a uh, a woman who served as a nurse in uh, Vietnam, again, I have a writer who is mm -hmm. very, uh, whom I identify with, uh, who is asked by someone else to tell her story of what it was like to be a nurse in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And at first she says, no, that's not how people write novels. But then this woman commits suicide. There's yet another suicide there. And um, in, that, in that book, the narrator is a strong presence in the beginning and then he completely withdraws and tells the whole mm -hmm. plot, as it were, of uh, that woman's year of service in Vietnam. And then more about the woman's life after she came home. And then, you know, returns to, it, then it becomes a kind of essayistic, also a kind of essayistic meditative narrative. Uh, and then with my next book, you know, again, very different, although once again, it's one woman telling mostly another woman's story. Mm -hmm. uh, and there certainly is a lot of plot going on there. Um, 
and then Salvation City, which was a really a, a, a more conventional third person story and doesn't has, have a woman at the at the center of it. Um, but these two books, which are these two books, which are my latest two novels, which are in fact, you know, quite similar as as people have pointed mm -hmm. out, and and I agree. Um, you know that I think it's a form that is really working for me now. That uh, that there is a, there is a story. Something happens. There are characters. Uh, there's a there's it's, there's a lot of invention in it. But I want the room. I want the space to be able to uh, to have to make reflections on what on on whatever material I'm talking about. Mm. Um, and I and I did want again that chorus of voices. Uh, people that she meets and count, she, you know, people that she encounters besides the friend who's going through the worst possible experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to have, uh, I wanted the narrator to be a listener. Mm -hmm. um, the, we received a couple of questions from the audience. The audience isn't oh. here with us, but they um, uh, several people send in their questions. Uh, I have three for you. Could we spend the last couple of minutes on 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 uh, discussing um, the problems that or the questions that the uh, the public has? And I'm going to read out Absolutely. these questions. All right. So the first one is um, when receiving the National Book Award, you said that writing gives one the wonderful possibility of being isolated from the world and a part of it at the same time. Pandemic also gave us a possibility for isolation, well, an obligation for isolation, actually. Did you miss, did you miss going out? Um, or did you find the situation an inspiration for more writing? Well, I think that the uh, lockdown and isolation were probably easier for me than for other people. Um, because I am used to, uh, you know, being solitary and working uh, in solitary. But it was such a, a, a drastic situation that, um, that I, was not, I was not able to write during that mm. time. I'm, I still haven't really been able to write. I, I was very, you know, because in New York it was very bad. Things were very, very bad. It, you know, we... We were the epicenter, and um, I found that I had a lot of trouble reading, and that was a very serious, seriously bad thing. And I, I had had, I was in the middle of writing a review essay, and luckily I was able to finish that. Then I tried to start something. I started a story, and I did not have the. I couldn't do it. I, I lost the concentration. Then I started writing another review essay, and that I have been able to uh, finish as well. But I feel that um, things have changed so much. Life has changed so much. I, I feel like I have to figure out what might be possible to write as far as fiction or a novel or a story um, goes now. I, uh, you know, I'm not sure. So I. Um, I'm in the same position as, as 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 other writers. I don't I don't really know mm. how to write just yet. I have to think about it. Mm. Um, as a teacher of creative writing, did you teach online in lockdown? And what are the differences this mode of communication introduces into your communication with young writers? Well, in the spring, when all this began, uh, I was I was not teaching. And in the summer, I didn't teach. So, so far, the mm -hmm. fall semester has begun last week for me at Boston University. And we've had one class so far online. Now, luckily for me, it is a, it's a graduate uh, class, very serious mm -hmm. students, very good students. And they, uh, there are only 10 of them. So there's only 11 of us, which is not so difficult on the screen. Um, I dreaded it. I have not even been able to meet these students. Usually every fall, I take the train from New York to Boston and, and teach on campus and then stay overnight and come back. I've been doing that since 2011. It feels very strange and sad not to be able to do that. <laughs> um, I'm hoping 
uh, even though this course is only one semester, we'll get used to it. We'll do the best we can. The students are all over the place. But I'm hoping mm -hmm. that in spring, they will all be on campus. And even though I don't teach there in spring, at some point, I certainly hope I will be mm -hmm. going to meet them, at least to see them. So, um, you know, as I say, uh, for other people teaching different things, uh, large lectures, et cetera, young children, it's, it just seems extremely challenging. But for me, uh, you know, it, it's not really so bad. Mm. At least the mm. one class I had was not bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, there are two more questions. Um, one, perhaps will uh, uh, you will feel that you already spoken a little bit about it, but perhaps not. Which period in your career do you see as the most influential for your writing? University, the beginning of first and first publications, maybe the legendary friendship with Susan Zontag. Did you have another mentor who was particularly important for you and for the development of your writing style? Well, I have already talked about the importance of Susan Sontag. Uh, at the same time, another person really, really important to me. So I would say uh, that, that it was that particular period of time. Uh, first, I, uh, first, I met Elizabeth Hardwick at college, right after that, working for the New York Review of Books. And then from there, meeting Susan Sontag, and then after that, going back to work for the New York Review of Books. So those three, Elizabeth Hardwick and Susan Sontag and the New York Review, uh, happening at that time when I was in my uh, uh, late teens and 20s, um, I would say that that would be the, the, the most important time as far as, uh, you know, uh, what kind of writer and thinker I was going to become. Um, but in many ways, I feel that the, the most important time actually has, has been the last couple of years uh, with the writing of these last two books. Mm. I don't, I mean, that's, there's something about where I feel like, uh, you know, something else has happened. I, I, I feel like I, I have found my voice and a subject in a way that maybe I, I didn't have before. Mm. Well, we're waiting for your next book then. <laughs> um, and it, the last question from, uh, from our public, um, your narrator in The Friend remembers how her friend and mentor used to criticize the contemporary desire to publish and self-publish, which he considered a catastrophe and death of literature. What is, in your opinion, the most important element in the education of young authors? They often dream of self-publication, but you seem to be very critical of it. What is the biggest problem with self-publishing and beginning your career this way? Is it, there is, no, is it that there is no verification from somebody more experienced? Or is it that these publications do not get enough at attention and there is no promotional support? Well, I think hey, the most important thing that I, I think uh, uh, for people who want to write and people who are starting out and who are young is to is to be reading a great deal. I uh, one of the shocking things for me uh, as a professor of creative writing is that uh, um, more and more students in these classes, these are people who want to become writers. Uh, mm -hmm. they, uh, they read less and less and they have more and more contempt for reading. This is something I don't understand. This is something that would have been unheard of uh, uh, when I was a young writer. So that's the most important thing. Uh, the, the, I, this is, was, you know, my character who was speaking, who was, uh, uh, you know, being very concerned about the, the future of writing and publishing. Um, the problem is really not strictly uh, the idea of self-publishing. Uh, let me just say, uh, Virginia Woolf was self-published. <laughs> You know, that's true. Uh, it isn't this. It isn't the self-publishing. It's the quality of the work. And in general, uh, the problem, is, certainly in the United States, is that everyone publishes way too much. The publishers, the writers themselves, people just keep putting things out there. Uh, there's just too much. You couldn't possibly promote all of that work. Uh, so you might think that people would then want to self-publish. It is extremely difficult to try to get any kind of attention for self-published work. But one of the reasons for that is that, uh, you know, in general, the self-published work is, is not is not Virginia Woolf-like work. Uh, it, it, you know, it's very poor and it, 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 it's 
a lot of it is uh, work where people just they just want to get them their 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 stuff out there. They 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 they're not particularly re- interested in reading or in other books or or, or other writers or uh, literary traditions. They they just want to you know they want to be mm-hmm. published, and there has to be a lot more <laughs> than just being published that you know you have to have something to say and you have to have uh develop the skills to say it so that it's meaningful to people to read um so that's what i would say about that perhaps that's your old-fashioned susan zontag idea of writing as a vocation rather than profession (laughs) yes indeed indeed (laughs) Yes. Um, if I may, I would like to finish this conversation off because unfortunately we have to close it up with a, the last question from myself. And I hope it's not going to be too personal. I was wondering, what is the thing that you enjoy most about being alive? About being alive? See, I thought you were going to right. say about being a writer, of course. About being <laughs> no, alive. about um... being alive. <laughs> Oh, the thing I enjoy most. Well, I think, I think, I just think, you know, what's going on? Uh, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the fact that, uh, that there's so much, you know, the, the, you're, you're alive, <laughs> you have uh, your five senses, right? Uh, there's always something going on. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, so much, so much is happening, and so much is different from yourself. Uh, you, you could never really get bored. It seems to me, uh, some there must be some great unhappiness in a person if that person is bored or gets bored, because uh, I guess uh, the thing about being alive is being able to take in, you know, the richness of of the world and and human experience. I mean, there's a you know, it, 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 it does always continue to, to shock me since people behave so badly in so many ways, uh, how extremely beautiful the world is and how uh, beautiful and interesting and, 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 and how, how much there is to, to, to enjoy and, and care about and think about. Um, that and, and food. <laughs> food is so good. <laughs> you know. I do, I do really enjoy food. <laughs> it makes me happy to be alive, to eat a, to eat a good peach. It makes me, makes me feel that how, nice, how nice that this has been arranged, that you have a, you have a, a tongue in your mouth, you have flavor buds, that you can enjoy, uh, you can enjoy food so much. And that makes me happy to be alive, that I can eat. I really do hope you will one day come to Krakow and we can go eat something oh. together. I love eating too. And I'm, I'm really, really sad that this um, uh, p- pandemic situation uh, uh, made it impossible for you to travel to to meet um, um, with Krakow audience in uh, the Konrad Festival, which I think personally is uh, gets together um, probably the most interesting writers around the world with probably the most sensitive and interesting audience. Um, so we will be waiting for you. And uh, I wanted to say that we thank you. I thank you for the books um, and for the interesting conversation. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed it very much. And I have to say I was extremely disappointed uh, when I learned that I was not going to be making this trip because I was greatly looking forward to it. So yes, uh, in the future, uh, I'm sure it will happen. And since you mentioned it, um, I have to be honest and say that one of the things I was looking forward to was eating. I was looking, (laughs) I thought, oh, and then I will be in Poland where I've never been. And that actually is a kind of cuisine that I like very much. So it was one of my first thoughts about going. Of course, you know, all the writers and all the interesting ideas, but I was thinking, oh, <laughs> I wonder what they'll be to eat. So <laughs> on that note. <laughs> all right. So there is a plan. <laughs> There's a plan. <laughs> There's a plan. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. <laughs> and thank you. And take care. Stay safe and well. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.